Casa is a design studio and think tank with offices spread around New York, Philippines, Colombia, and Peru, rooted in analytical processes, bottom up approach, interdisciplines, and holistic, sustainable mindset. The studio creates concept driven environments, buildings, and urban plans that explore how architecture can shape meaningful experiences, enhance the context where it's built, and connect people to culture, to each other, and to nature. Today, we are joined by Carlos Arnaiz, the founder and principal of CASA, and we will be chatting <laughs> about integrating research, cultural respect, and well-being in architecture. So nice to have you here. Thank you, Karina. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to chat with you and to connect with your uh, listeners. Likewise. So will you first tell us about your background and about the firm? My background, well, I was uh, born in the Philippines and I lived really in Southeast Asia and Asia my whole life um, until I was about 18, bounced around in different countries in that region. Um, I came to the United States uh, for university and I first uh, didn't, in fact, really discover architecture. My my initial uh let's say academic ex, uh, exposure was in the fields of philosophy and environmental science. Um, and if you ask yourself, how did I get to architecture? Well, maybe if you mash up philosophy and in the environment, you might arrive at architecture. That's kind of the backdoor entry that I used to get to this profession. Um, uh, I have been based out of New York for the last uh, 20 or so years, and I worked in different firms here in the city for about six years before founding my office. And I started CASA about 15 years ago. And uh, CASA has its headquarters here in New York, as you mentioned. We have uh, our satellite offices, uh, both in Asia and South America. That's also partly my background. Uh, you know, I have an Asian side, but also my, my mom is from Colombia. So that's one of the reasons why we have a foothold in that region. And uh, Casa also has a sister company called Serba, which is geared towards analytical um, tools for looking at how cities are changing and growing. Serba is more of a kind of think tank geared uh, towards policy and the government, um, both public and private sector regional planning. Yeah. That's neat. So um, what is your design approach, if you have to uh, describe it, and what inspired it initially? Um, well, you know, I, I, I find design to be kind of today, um, especially given all the changes in digital computation and artificial intelligence, one of the most um, powerful human forms of intelligence, because it really means that we're kind of looking at our role uh, in this world, um, looking at all the materials that we're surrounded with, and we try to design technologies, tools to adapt um, ourselves and the world to our um, needs and our new, let's say, paradigms. And so in a way, design um, has always been a kind of interactive discourse with our environment in our societies and so that way of thinking about design is kind of the, the platform around which we we base our let's say methodology so that a lot of it as a result has to do with the kind of listening to um, the cues that we get from every project whether the cues are geographical in terms of a place or social in terms of the communities or many times kind of psychological or economic in terms of what the client brings to the table. You know, I always say that one of the big differences between architecture and let's say the fine arts, painting, sculpture, poetry, is that those disciplines really in a way don't need a client. Um, and by client, I don't mean just the person who comes to you with a check, but by client, I mean the the community, the place, these are all clients, agents that play a role in architecture. And to some degree, architecture needs all of those other agents because they are like the starters and they instigate the, and produce all of the challenges for a designer, which are necessary in that kind of discursive um, 
format for design. That's really nicely said. Um, what do you think is a design rooted in culture? And how do you ensure that a design is uh, is that like deeply rooted in culture and traditions? Well, this is, I think, one of the most interesting questions today because of, you know, the rising consciousness around identities and how, you know, cultural identities are so diverse and so different, um, yet at the same time also being uh, affected by globalization and in social media in which we are, yes, we are so different, but also we are so connected. And I think that push and pull is uh, in that kind of tension is very interesting, um, I would say, and then inevitable. I don't want, you know, I'm, I'm by nature, my outlook is always that of an optimist and trying to sort of see the potential silver linings in any situation. And I think the, the role of looking for culture and tradition today really means um, what the first I think is being very, careful and sensitive to history. Um, you know, I, I, I teach architecture in the university and I tell my students all the time that one of the greatest things about being an architect is that you're not alone. And by that, I mean that when you come up to any problem, you know, there are so many other architects and traditions and cultures that have looked at this problem before you you know, whether it's tribal architecture in a place like Indonesia, such amazing buildings, you know, built in the different islands, or whether it's, you know, imperial architecture, like what the Romans built, you know, there's there are all of these traditions and they can, they can uh, intermingle and they can cross-pollinate each other. And to look at those traditions and kind of be constantly asking yourself, so how do I advance the, the field? while at the same time being connected to the past. Because, you know, obviously our situation today based on very pressing issues like climate change and, you know, what we're doing to our environment and how buildings are supposed to respond is different than 50 years ago or 100 years ago. I, I am adamantly, you know, a believer that the place we are today in architecture is not the same 50 years ago. We have to do things differently. But at the same time, you still have to look at history. So I think that that sort of dual perspective, like uh, you know, one of my favorite philosophers is this uh, uh, writer, sort of um, he's a German uh, theorist called Walter Benjamin, and he talked about the angel of history being th thrown forward but having to look back. And I think that that image of you're moving in one direction but you have your head gazing towards the, the rear is kind of the situation of, of how design has to operate with a relationship to its traditions and its cultures. <clears throat> yeah, because sometimes even like the answers are already there to current problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we sometimes abandon or forget or think because, you know, we have, you know, electricity or something, it's a better solution. You know, there's, yeah, 100%, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm especially curious about how have you integrated research and analysis to understand, you know, the cultural aspect of it and also the ecological aspect of each project? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, you know, research and analysis is kind of my passion in a way. It's, they're, it's something that I always start with, just partly because maybe of my background, given that I studied philosophy before I studied design, so to some degree, I write down questions before I make a sketch. It's maybe just my 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 modality of, of thought, and as a result, I we in the office try to approach every project like a research project in the sense that we say, okay, this project, small or big, uh, you know, far or close, has a research topic. Um, or maybe topics, plural, that we should be clear about. And those research topics can drive the design and we can, you know, um, always come back to them like an anchor in terms of when, you know, it's inevitably sometimes in, in architecture or any design projects also, 
the architecture sometimes is very complex and you get lost in the details and you're sort of embedded in the mechanical electrical systems and you forget, you know, what, 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 what again am I doing here? You know, well, what's the big idea? And so I think having the research topic as a reminder, oh, this is what I was, this is what we're thinking about, you know, is I think very important. Also, I, I think, you know, in the end of the day, or let's say after a certain cycle, whether it's one year, two years, when you look back at your work, I think it's very important to be able to um, understand where your research is going in terms of its its, aggr its aggregated and collective um, sum. So that's one of the reasons why in the office, for example, after every two to five years, we create little books, um, like little documents, uh, whether they're a small book for ourselves or whether, you know, we have now published two books and we're in the process of publishing three books. And each of these books are kind of about our research and they evolved after, you know, maybe five years where our research question started with one project and then it evolved into another one. And then it got more complex when we added another project and we realized, oh, there's a thread here. You know, there's kind of a story. And so we should be able to tell that story and connect the dots. Um, actually, like, like, your, like, your, like your show, it's called The Design Story. You know, I, I think it's very important to be able to use storytelling as a form of, you know, research, uh, let's say, as a form of research, as a form of understanding the value of your research, you know. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> we love to share yeah. with us uh, one or two of your projects um, that, you know, maybe successfully incorporated culture and traditional influences to architecture and about the initial goals and the impact. Yeah, yeah. Um, it would do two projects. One is under construction. It's almost finished. And the other one is finish the design about to go into construction and engineering. So there are the different stages. Um, the first is called the Kamsur Capital or Capital. And it's a, uh, they're both of actually government buildings, but at different scale. The Kamsur Capital is a provincial government building. And the, that building um, was interesting to us for two reasons in this, especially in, in the light of this conversation about culture and research. Um, because the first is when we were tasked to design this, it was one of the first times in the Philippines, this is the Philippines where a provincial government in the last 20 years has built a building. Uh, and so we asked ourselves, so what should the building look like? You know, like you don't really know in terms of the identity. Like, what should a building of this country represent? And so, what's the history? You know, obviously, like many Southeast Asian countries, Philippines has a very mixed history of colonialism, of a national emergence um, during the post-war era, um, and. So I think we did a lot of thinking and research around the story of national identity and and how it connects also to nature. And so we were really interested in agriculture and in the type of native trees around the area, in the volcanic history, because the building happens to sit in front of a giant volcano, beautiful, beautiful volcano. And so we were connecting kind of the story of the place, also to the geography and the natural history and the uh, this very specific type of tree that grows there, which is called a peely tree, which has this very specific kind of nut. And so that whole kind of natural history um, became part of the story of the building. And that was in a way the, the seed for the iconography and the way in which we thought of the building and also the building um, was placed in a completely new place, like essentially in rice fields. And it was supposed to become the site for a whole new, it will become in right now the building, this whole new district. And so the question also of monumentality, of frontality of buildings, you know, how does the building express itself in relationship to its urban surroundings, 
Um, does it have one door? Does it have many doors? So in fact, we specifically wanted a building that had many doors, many front faces, not just one. You know, unlike let's say the, you know, the, the classical sort of Western uh, government building with one, you know, one main entrance facing the piazza or the, you know, as you can see in most sort of European style, um, let's say urban quarters where there's a very clear symmetry. In this case, the, the building is a sort of building in the round. It has multiple entries. It's, it's about the connection to the environment. And the other really critical factor was the fact that this part of the Philippines is battered by really intense storms. Uh, you know, hurricanes, cyclones, what they call typhoons in the Philippines, some of the strongest in the world, um, which leaves thousands of people every year homeless, you know, without electricity, without water. And so what we convinced the government of doing was essentially creating a, a build, two buildings for one. This is like the what what many people don't understand of this building, but it's like we were able to smuggle like a Trojan horse into the building because what we said is, look, we have to place uh, because for flooding reasons we had to create like a podium, mm -hmm. and we said, well, when we create that podium, uh, why don't we create essentially a uh, a emergency response center? for the government at this first floor, which was not part of the original scope, but we were able to do it for the same price essentially. And so the whole first level of the building uh, works as like a triage zone for emergency response where you can, where we have, you know, um, water collection facilities, we have generators, we have medical supplies, we have et cetera, et cetera, so that, um, the, the let's say the government side of the building doesn't really start at the plus level two. And the first level is essentially public when it's when there's no emergency. Well, it's a nice public area where people can hang out and sit and do picnics and that sort of thing. But if during um, any type of disaster relief situation, we have areas where the ambulances can come, helicopters can land, People can be sheltered. They can give out disaster relief supplies, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the kind of the most interesting um, uh, byproduct of that building. And then the second building um, we're doing is just a, is a city hall uh, building. And it's in an area uh, with a big agricultural also story because it's one of the biggest uh, sugarcane producing regions in the world. And we were very interested in the recycling aspect of sugarcane and how sugarcane today is not just a product to make sugar, but also is being used for biofuel and is being used to, um, to have all of these other, let's say, sustainable byproducts. So this question of a metabolic cycle, we call it a metabolic kind of uh, machine, um, was this theme of this project. So in this project, we conceived of architecture really as um, the most interesting and advanced metabolic technology that we have. And by metabolic technology, we mean the interface between us and an environment, specifically as it has to do with water, waste, energy. And so those three, uh, what we call metabolic flows, are mediated by architecture. And so how buildings process waste, how buildings transform energy, and how buildings, you know, take in water, store it, move it, and then and then give it out is the whole story of this building. So this building, um, it's going to be released in the next, I think, two months. Um, I think it will be the first of its kind where we have uh, giant har water rain harvesting umbrellas, um, quite, quite big, where we have all, we have heat chimneys that move the hot air out. We have water cisterns underneath the building that to collect water. We have, um, of course, 
terraces on the edges. We have solar panels. I mean, it's, it's, it looks like a machine. It's kind of amazing. It's like a, I would say it's almost like a 21st century version of the Pompidou Center in Paris that, you know, that Richard Brothers and Norman Foster did at that time. It was meant to look like a machine, you know, with the escalators on the outside and all the pipes um, exposed. But I would say at that time, the question of the environment was not so, was different. And when Foster and Rogers made that building, I think the notion of the machine was more an aesthetic idea where you, the building is representing like a machine. But here, it doesn't really look like a machine, but it really works like a machine. So I think now the question is not, is both aesthetic, but also what I would call performative, because now it really works to, and we now know exactly how it should work, because I think now we have, you know, I would say 50, 70 years after the Pompidou, we have a lot of data about how our buildings work. We know how much water they make. We know, I mean, we also know, unfortunately, like architecture is some of the worst carbon emitter in the world. You know, if we think if we want to select some of the, 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 um, the culprits of, of the environmental disaster, architecture, unfortunately, is top. So we know how to solve it. You know, we have that information. So I think this is like applying it to, to the buildings. Can't wait to see it completed. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> Lastly, uh, what future challenges do you anticipate in this dynamic landscape of architecture? And how do you think you plan to address them? Well, it's uh, a good question tough one i mean i think i i think i see two very clear future challenges uh and um i'll state the challenge and then i'll figure out how to address them that that's the more complicated part but the challenges to me are very clear i think today in the 21st century every architect faces two very unique challenges number one is um the what we might call the Anthropocene, you know, the, the environmental crisis that is really serious, and of course it makes itself manifest in so many ways. Whether you're talking about flooding, or you're talking about intense heat, or you're talking about fire, um, or you know, so many, or you're talking about carbon emissions and putting net zero targets. There are so many challenges to that problem, but it's clearly the anthropocentric problem. The second one is the digital. Um, I think the way in which our digital environments, our digital forms of communication, how that's changing our notion of physical space is a challenge. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I think both of those produce a lot of opportunities. Um, so like I said earlier, would we get to the environment? Because architecture, we know, is such a, uh, a a culprit of our problem. I just, and there's been a lot of research into it. Everyone is looking at it. Many companies are trying to explore new materials, um, new methods of the construction. So I think that produces a lot of opportunity. And so the idea is to, you know, you got to research, you got to collaborate, you got to be open minded, you got to think that we can. We can't do things the way they used to do at the same time as we still have to look at history. So this notion that, you know, we're moving forward, but also having our, our sights back. That's the challenge for the environment. For the, the digital side, you know, it's to me, it's kind of uh, very, you know, that this is such a rapidly evolving topic, you know, not even a year ago, did we even know what chat and GBT was and now it's everywhere. Right. Um, and uh, and who knows what it will be like in a year and not even five years. It's kind of incredible the speed by which these things are changing. Um, but I think the question is that architecture um, will be transformed by it. Um, how? It's hard to tell. I, mean, I think, but the question, I think as architects, we kind of have to keep our fingers to the ground and listen to the pulse of communities, of journalists telling stories and see how 
our buildings can participate in telling that story of a changing society. Because I think one thing that is intractable and will remain part of architecture is that it is one of the most important technologies for how humans relate to each other and to their environment. Now, how are humans, how we define a human and how the environment is changing will change, but still the, the architecture as the intermediate uh, tool is going to be somewhere there. And so I think to remember that it's, uh, you know, although the terms might change, the tools and the, and the role of the technology should still be there. That's, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for sharing. I think we learned you, a lot in our conversation. And also, I think my personal favorite part is when you said architecture is always listening to, you know, listening to the culture around us, listening to the society, what is happening. And I'm pretty sure through the research questions that you produce over maybe the 15 years of practice, uh, you can see like how society is changing um, and how the narrative, like you said, is developing and changing also. Um, so it's nice that to see how architecture is and always be a reflection of culture and society. So thank you so much. Thank you, Karina. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm grateful to have connected and, and, and for you to give, uh, you know, spend time with me. It was, it's great to chat. Thank you. Appreciate it.